Here we go. All right. Welcome to um, to our lunch and learn today. Um, because I am really bad at remembering to um, to tell everyone all the things that I want to tell them. I've decided, thanks to some advice of an excellent board member, who I think is on here, are coming on right now. Um, I went ahead and put them in a, into a PowerPoint slide. So here we go. Alrighty, welcome to um, our Lunch and Learn series on Burning Bonanza. Today we are going to be talking about, uh, talking with Master Gardeners about attracting birds and keeping our yards healthy for them. Um, we have two more great weeks in this session as well. Um, next week um, on March 3rd, we're going to be talking with people about how to prevent bird window collisions, uh, which is a major um, which is a major cause of fatalities for birds. Um, and then the other big thing that um, impacts a lot of bird um, populations is cats. So on March 10th, we're gonna be talking about the impact of our domestic cats on birds as well. Um, at that point, we'll be wrapping up this Lunch and Learn series, but we are in the works of putting together our next one, which will hopefully start on March 24th um, and go all the way through the end of May. Um, tentatively, this, this, this title might change. Tentatively, we're calling it um, Nature Connections. Um, and it's really all about the different science that you can do in your backyard and community through citizen science programs, um, all on just a huge variety of wonderful topics, whether you want to talk about birds or butterflies or bees or water quality or frogs and amphibians. So there's a lot of really, really great stuff that I think is going to come out of, um, of that next series as well. And hopefully inspire everyone to really enjoy the spring and get outside into their yards and into their community and maybe come visit Box Audubon um, and do some really with that. So I also wanted to Sure that I thank everybody. Many of you um, made very lovely donations to register for this program. I just want to thank you all very, very much for that. Um, we really appreciate it. Your support means a lot to us um, and allows us to continue to do these programs um, and continue to, to serve all the people that we do with our um, with our programs and our wonderful site. So thank you. Um, also, if you are not already a member, um, it would be great if you wanted to support Bucks Audubon by becoming a member, which you can do easily on our website, um, or you can give us a call if that works better. But, um, but we'd love everyone to become a member. You get discounts on programs, you get um, our newsletters, and just a lot of really um, great opportunities to connect with us more. Um, also, coming out to visit our site. Um, our grounds are open, dawn to dusk every day. They're a little snow covered at the moment and a little icy in spots. Um, but once all the snow melts away, I um, highly encourage everyone to come out. Spring is a great time to come out and see the site. Start to see, you know, I'm sure once the snow melts, we're going to start seeing some of the um, ephemeral spring wildflowers. Um, we're going to be moving quickly then after that into bird migration. So definitely come out, enjoy the site. It's beautiful in the spring. Lots of things to see, a nice wonderful way to connect with nature. Um, and then also here is the, um, the link to our calendar on our website. Um, there's a lot of other great programs that we do, including um, monthly bird walks. We do them on the first and third Saturday of each month um, on our site. We have our lunch and learn series. Um, we have other family programs coming up in March. We're doing a frog walk um, and we'll do an introductory program um, via Zoom um, on, I believe, oh, I should look this up. It's the 25th, I believe, of March. And then on the 27th of March, we are going to be um, doing a um, on-site evening um, frog walk to look for frogs. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, we are also looking for volunteers right now to help us with our Bluebird Nest Box Monitoring Program. So if you're interested in that, definitely reach out. Um, so there's just a lot of really great things um, and we hope everyone will, you know, will not only come to these wonderful programs, but also get involved with us in other ways. All righty, that's my spiel for that. <laughs> um, so we are going to jump into um, to our program and we want to thank Susan very, very much um, with the Master Gardeners Program for agreeing to do this. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Um, she'll share her screen and then we'll get going with this program. So Susan, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Susan Hotham. I'm a Master Gardener and Master Watershed Steward. I'm going to be um, sharing my slide deck. So I'm going to put myself on um, off for the video and I'm going to start sharing my slide deck for you. Okay. 
And we're going to start with the first slide on attracting and maintaining native bird populations. So welcome everybody. Um, there we go. Our, this presentation is going to be on attracting and maintaining our native bird populations, but it's also going to focus on native plants and insects, as well as IPM, I'll explain what that is, and chemical usage, and how they affect insects and bird populations. My name again is Susan Hotham. I'm a member of the Penn State Extension Bucks County Master Gardener and Master Watershed Steward programs. Um, I'll have a lot of links at the very end, so you'll be able to see um, how to get to that. And you can also become one if you'd like to become a um, MG, Master Gardener or Master Watershed Steward, MWS. Um, I'm also the conservation chair for the Bucks County DAR. And I've worked as a farm manager for a small farm in Bucks County. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in general science secondary education, and I started my master's degree in biology and botany, which I completed in pharmaceutics, and I'm a trainer for a pharmaceutical company. So this slide here shows the agenda, which is going to cover an explanation of natives and how we can use natives in our landscapes and what some of the most valuable native plants are. Then we're going to discuss native insects and pollinators and how to attract the birds. Next, we'll cover the integrated pest management, focusing on biocontrol and leaving the leaves for our native insects. We're going to discuss best management practices on how and when to use chemicals if needed, as well as some poor chemical choices and harmful ones that you'd be familiar with, such as DDT, that affect larger organisms. We're going to wrap up with a summary and how all these topics work together to maintain our native bird populations. Also in our resource source section at the end, you'll find references to materials used to create this presentation. Note that any pictures that you see throughout this presentation um, are my own personal pictures unless there's a link underneath them. And um, also please feel free to take pictures of any of these so that you can have the link if you wanna go and view more information on a specific link. And one final note before we get started with the actual demonstration, um, I do have a couple dogs and they occasionally like to bark. So I do apologize for that. And also um, my husband is currently re renovating the bathroom upstairs. So hopefully that won't be too noisy for you. So what are native species? Here's one definition of a native species. A native, native species is one that's involved in a given space over a period of time sufficient to develop a complex and essential relationship with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. So species are a group of living organisms consisting of similar individual individuals who are capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding. One such native plant species to PA would be our state flower called the mountain laurel. And you can see that here on this picture. But natives are not just plants. Any animals, insects, birds, etc., that meet the definition on this slide is considered a native species. So why should we use native plants in our landscapes? First, we need to help protect our shrinking wildlife habitats and assist in preserving biodiversity. Biodiversity is referring to the number of different species in a location. We can maintain or even increase biodiversity in wildlife habitats by adding native plants to our own yards. As I learned in my Penn State Master Gardeners course, worldwide 55,000 species are lost every year. At our current rate, according to data from Yale School of Forestry and Environment, by 2030, we will lose one third of all plant and animal species. So if we increase our use of native plants in our yards, we can help reverse this trend. And another reason to use native plants is that they are acclimated to the specific type of soil, water, light, and humidity in their native habitat, and therefore are more hardy to live in a specific location. Also, by planting native plants, we may conserve water with less frequent watering of our gardens because the native plants are used to the amount of water they usually receive in their native habitats. These plants will also tend to reproduce and populate better in their native soils, helping to outcompete the native species. When we use native plants, we provide a native wildlife habitat. 
Having increased native plants increases wildlife habitat for other species like native insects, birds, snakes, frogs, and larger organisms. One thing to consider is that native plants produce flowers and seeds at the time the native insects, pollinators, and native birds need to use them, as these organisms have evolved to support each other over time. According to information from Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware, these are the top four most valuable native woody and perennial plants in the mid-Atlantic region where we live. Their valuable traits are based on terms of the most biodiversity that these plants can support. By counting the number of Lepidoptera or butterfly and moss species attracted to them. For example, oaks were found to support 557 species of Lepidoptera and goldenrod were found to support 115 species. So if you want to have the biggest impact on supporting native pollinators, I suggest planting native species of these type of woody plants and perennials. Many of my favorite native plants also attract hummingbirds. And in this case, hummingbirds are actually pollinators. Here you can see ones that are in my gardens that provide for many months of nectar. So you can see, I start with daffodils that start to flower in the early spring, going all the way down to a New England aster, which then flowers um, and in late fall. And then that way, Throughout the year, the hummingbirds and other pollinators constantly have native plants that they can feed from. Did you know that 90% of our native insects are specialists that feed on only four families of plants that are native to our PA lands? These families include asters, mints, dill, and legumes. Most insects can only digest the plants that they actually evolved with. Adult beneficial insects primarily feed on nectar, so it's important to have something in bloom from early spring to late fall if possible. As stated before, native plants need native pollinators to reproduce. These next three slides show some of our native insects. Here you can see moth pollinators. Our family of moths in this area is called Hesperidae. Many of these moths pollinate in the evening hours. The bee pollinators on our area include the solitary bees, the mason bees, the queen bumblebees, sweat bees, also known as halactid bees. If you'd like to take part in the bee pollinator citizen sur scientist survey, please take a picture of this slide down here, and you can also help by counting these bees. The fly pollinators you may be familiar with include soldier flies of two families, the strati stratiomyce and odontomaya. They also include the surfid or hover flies and true flies called tachnid flies. Now that you learned about native plants and insects, let's learn about attracting native birds to our landscapes. Did you know that our native birds rely on native plants for more than shelter, such as for building nests and for hiding predators? They need native plants for seeds and berries as food sources, but they also rely on native plants for their native insects. Birds need native insects to feed their young, as you can see here with this robin feeding their baby. 96% of terrestrial birds feed insects to their young. And that's a lot of insects. So for example, in order to raise one clutch of chickadees, the young need up to 9,000 caterpillars during their growing period. This was found in a study at the University of Delaware. Since the 1960s, 40% of songbirds have declined in number. And this is partially a direct result of the reduction in native insects and their native plants. Sometimes we do need to do something to control invasive insect species from destroying our native habitats or gardens. When considering how to control these pests, let's first consider IPM or integrated pest management. IPM is the management of pests that minimizes the use of chemicals and emphasizes natural methods or low toxicity methods. 
One such example you may be familiar with is crop rotation, in which you move a crop to a different area from the previous year. By doing this, any insects that were overwintering in the soil, for example, will not have the crop directly available to them to feed on, thereby reducing the pest insect population. If you have a small garden, hand picking harmful insects may be another simple chemical free solution. And another example of IPM is using pest traps or scouting. Scouting is directly looking at the plants and finding the pest species. Pest traps are used by placing sticky traps in locations around crops, such as in orchards. And some traps may contain pheromones that attract a target species. By placing traps throughout your landscapes, you can monitor when pests have arrived to your garden, and then you can decide what to do about the pest rather than applying chemicals throughout the year. One way to manage pests is to use biocontrol. There are key advantages to using biocontrol, such as no toxicity concerns to plants or insects, and targeted pests will be eaten by introduced native insects. By not using chemicals, the targeted insects also will not develop chemical resistances. So let's learn about some of these insects used to control the pest po insect population. So some of the pollinators that we learned about earlier are excellent I IPM biocontrol agents. Many of the cirrhid fly and hoverfly species larvae feed on aphids. Hoverflies will lay their eggs where they expect aphids to arrive. Tachnid flies will lay their eggs on host native plants for the larvae to feed on when they hatch. And these flies are parasitoids and will kill grasshoppers, potato beetle larvae, Japanese beetles, gypsy moth, caterpillars, squash bugs, and stink bugs. Lacewings, you can see right here, in their immature stages feed on aphids, white flies, mite, mites, mealybugs, scale, and caterpillars. Even though they do feed on caterpillars, remember that not all caterpillars are beneficial as they may destroy crops such as cab the cabbage butterfly. So over here, you can see the young lacewing. Lacewings are also nicknamed aphid lions because of their appetite for aphids. To attract lacewings to your garden, plant flowers such as Coreopsis, Cosmos, and Angelica. Brown beetles, are also another beneficial insect because they eat many larvae um, that live in the soil, such as gypsy moths and Japanese beetle larvae. And here you can see one eating a slug, right down here. Assassin bugs, as immature nymphs and adults, eat harmful caterpillar species, Japanese beetles, aphids, and leafhoppers. And here you can see an assassin bug eating a potato bug. Another more well-known insect is the lady beetle. These are well-known for eating aphids, but also eat mealybugs and white flies and are just as predaceous in their larval stage as in their adult stage. Wasps may also be an excellent biocontrol. Different wasp species feed on cicadas, flies, crickets, caterpillars, spiders, stink bugs, and beetle larvae. They'll also feed insects to their young. Here is one that's eating a hornworm. Late summer and fall, however, wasps are considered pests when they change their taste for sweets, like my peaches on my peach tree. Even though some of the above do eat spiders, one type of spider that is beneficial as a biocontrol is the spiny ore weaver. I didn't show an image here because I'm not as fond of spiders. Um, these spiders eat many small pests and crops in other gardens. And optionally, you may use, also use a bacteria to control mosquitoes in your ponds. Bacillus thuringiensis, also known as BT, feeds off the larval stages of mosquitoes. I place mosquito dunks in my retention pond and never have a problem with mosquitoes. And this bacteria is a great biocontrol because it does not harm other insects in the area. BT may also be sprayed to target pest caterpillars, but it won't har harm non-targeted insects. Many of the species named above can be encouraged to your gardens or crops by planting native plants. Additionally, you may purchase ladybugs and lacewings from different retailers. 
To assist in conservation efforts, let's also leave the leaves. Leaf litter, litter is beneficial for insects to overwinter and for birds and snakes to forage. This picture here shows caddisfly larvae on decomposing leaves. Leaving leaves will allow for decomposition, which will improve the soil. But not only should you leave the leaves, but leave the stems of native plants to stand during the winter as insects may be living in them. It also adds interest to your garden. And you can always clean up the leaves and flower stems in the spring after the beneficial insects have hatched or left the area. Occasionally, even when you use biocontrol or IPM methods, you may still have a pest outbreak that can, cannot be controlled without chemicals. When using chemicals, you should use best management practices or BPMs to reduce the risk to insects and larger organisms. Ideally, you would want to select chemicals that have little or no residual activity down in this area here and that have no harm to native plants or insects. This means that even you, though you may spray a chemical that could kill beneficial insects, the selected chemical would not have a long-term effect in the area, allowing for beneficial insects to return the area. Being aware of the toxicity of the chemical is the first thing that you should consider if you're choosing to use one. A few suggestions on safer choices are insecticidal soaps, all-season horticultural oils, and microbial products like Bt and botanical insecticides. Insecticidal soaps are the least harmful option as their mode of action is to interfere with the waxy cuticle on an insect. Some botanical insects insecticides include neem, pyrethrins, and rotenones. These have a short period of activity, much less than synthetic insecticides, and they break down quickly with sun exposure. These are less toxic over the long term than the items shown here in orange and red. It's best to use a chemical that is either an ingestible for a target species or a contact poison for that target species. But remember that you need to consider what other species could possibly ingest or be affected by a spray. Systemic poisons and fumigants are going to be discussed on additional slides. When chemicals are used, it's very important to follow directions on the packaging to use no more than is needed. Use safety data sheets or SDS to ensure you are using the proper protective personal equipment or PPE to protect yourself. On the SDS, you'll learn about where not to spray, such as near bodies of water, for example, and how to properly clean up chemicals and equipment after use. One other thing to consider is to communicate with other local growers, neighbors, and bee farmers. When using chemicals, reach out to your neighbors to see what they plant and when, and what type of chemicals they may be using. For example, if your neighbor has beehives, like in this picture here, you may not wanna use chemicals at a time when the bees may be most actively pollinating like the, these clovers being in full bloom. Also, be aware of the weather and try not to use chemicals during high wind or particularly dry weather conditions. Dust and wind will carry the chemical powders and sprays to undesired locations. Systemic insecticides kill beneficial as well as pest insects, and they last for a long time which means they continue to kill beneficial insects. Some systemic insecticides may also be considered broad spectrum because they may also kill many different types of insects without targeting a specific targeted insect. Also, if these systemic insects are applied in a nursery setting, just be aware that they can cause the plants to produce toxic pollen and nectar, which could harm the beneficial pollinating insects. Beneficial insects are more sensitive to these chemicals than the pests that are being attempted, they're, they're trying to control, because many of these pests are starting to become resistant to these chemicals. So here you can see a picture of how systemic insecticides are injected into a plant. And then how the in insects, such as an aphid, will suck on the leaf and ingest that poison 
that went throughout that entire plant. Many systemics will biomagnify as the chemical concentrates up the food chain. So for example, if a chemical is sprayed on a plant and the insect eats the plant, the songbird eats many insects, the snake eats many songbirds, and then the bird of prey eats snakes. Now the bird of prey could have concentrated high levels, toxic levels of the chemical. Fumigants are so harmful that they are controlled by being sold to certified applicators only who have been properly trained in their use. Fumigants are sprayed across fields and may travel in the air to unintended areas if not properly dispersed. So that's why this is very carefully controlled, this type of chemical. Additionally, seeds that are coated with insecticides and fungicides may actually do more harm than good. Birds may be harmed as they eat these seeds or as the dust associated with planting these seeds go into the air that they breathe. These pictures here show crop seeds coated with neonicotinoids, which we're going to discuss in an upcoming slide. When you purchase seeds, be sure to inquire as to whether they are organically grown without chemicals and if they were coated or exposed to insecticides and or herbicides. And if you do get a package of seeds from somebody, you can usually tell if they've been coated because they have a funny color. We all know DDT, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. It was, was and is a very harmful insecticide that was used in the 1940s and it's still being used illegally today. It was mainly used to fight insect-borne human diseases, primarily malaria and typhus. It was also then used for insect control for crops, but it was found to be very persistent in the environment, travel long distances in the air and water, and to accumulate in fatty tissues of larger organisms. Even earthworms are found to accumulate DDT and the robins eating them were getting poisoned. Here is a picture of an old spray containing 50% DDT. However, DDT and other chlorinated hydrocarbons do not usually kill the birds directly. What happened with DDT was that calcium thinned eggshells were causing the incubating birds to die as the shells were crushed. This occurred significantly in bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and brown pelicans. So here is a picture showing the biomagnification of DDT concentration in organisms from phytoplankton all the way up to the apex predator, the falcon there. By 1972, United States banned DDT, but there is still a number of organochlorides which are still being used that accumulate in the food chain. Dicofol is used extensively, which may include DDE, which is breakdown product of DDT. As well, DDT is still being found in migratory birds in the US, so it may still be used illegally or in other countries that have stockpiles of old chemicals. A neonicotinoid, also called a neonic, is a systemic agricultural synthetic insecticide that is absorbed by plants and resembles nicotine, targeting insects' acetylcholine receptors, thereby affecting their nervous systems when they chew or suck on a treated plant. This insecticide has been used since about the 1990s. It's thought to cause less toxicity to birds and mammals than to invertebra invertebrate insects. However, studies have shown that bees that ingest treated plants nectar seem to be lethargic, have impaired feeding, reduced fertility, and may also have increased mortality and even colony collapse from feeding on neonic treated plants. ABC Birds performed a study in 2013 in which they found that neonicotinoids can be lethal to birds. A single corn kernel or grain of wheat treated with imidacloprid was found to poison or even kill a bird. They found that even one-tenth of a treated seed eaten can affect reproduction during breeding season. However, it has been found that neonics are less harmful than organophosphate compounds, which they have been replacing. Uh, neonics currently are being used to control rosy apple aphid, potato leafhopper, and the brown marmorated stink bug. 
due to the lack of more IPM friendly alternatives to assist farmers in saving their crops from these pests. So one thing to understand is that our goal with integrated pest management is to make sure that if a pesticide or insecticide is to be used, that its benefits will outweigh the negative effects of its use. So please perform your own research to determine if using a neonicotinoid, pyrethrin, or other systemic broad spectrum or fumigant insecticide or pesticide outweighs the negative effects to the organisms in your environment before you plan to use them. So how can we maintain our native bird populations? First and foremost, plant native plants and remove invasive plants. The native habitat will provide shelter and seeds and berries for the birds. These native plants will attract native insects that have changed over time to adapt to these plants. And the native insects will provide food for the native baby birds. Use IPM by practicing things like crop rotation and the introduction of native insect populations that feed on pest insect species. If planting seeds, use ones that are not covered with pesticides or herbicides. Remember that the dust from planting a large number of these seeds can be inhaled by birds. And the birds can dig and eat seeds, which could cause them reproductive and physical harm. If chemical use is needed for pests, use chemicals that are least harmful, meaning they are short-lived with little or no residual activity and targeted to a specific insect, such as an insecticidal soap or bacillus thuringiensis. Avoid using broad spectrum systemic chemicals, fumigants and neonicotinoids if possible. And if absolutely needed for use, then adhere to strict regulatory and safety data sheet guidances so that our beneficial insects and higher organisms in the food chain, such as birds, will not be affected through biomagnification. We can maintain our native bird populations if we all work together and educate ourselves to do what is best for our plants, insects, birds, and the earth. Please see the references here and some links to additional native plant information. Feel free to take a picture of this slide. And I did wanna note while we are on this slide, um, the nature's best hope that you can see here with Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallamy is offering a lecture on Sunday, February 28th from two to 3 p.m. through the uh, Bowman's Hill Tower Preserve. Um, I've signed up for it. Um, you may sign up for it as well. You could probably search on Bowman Hill Flower Preserve website to find the link to sign up for that. And that's $15 to join that. Also, if you're interested in joining the Bucks County Master Gardeners or Master Watershed Steward, you can um, join here. You can go on the extension.psu.edu to find your local county's information. Um, if you're in Bucks County, you'll be getting in touch with Kathleen Connolly. That's the a Bucks County group is the one that I, I'm involved with. And um, if you're wondering what a master watershed steward is, that's somebody who um, goes beyond just the plants. Um, we're looking at the rivers and the streams and what affects the insects and the fish in those streams. Um, such things we monitor as um, erosion on the sides of stream banks. Um, I have four different locations that I monitor in Nishamne Creek every month. Um, we also do winter testing of the salts in the water because um, as more and more salt is added to the streets and washes into our rivers, the salts go up extremely high and can um, also be detrimental to the insects and the fish population. Um, so that's something that we monitor as well. And so the, uh, the master gardener specifically concentrates on plants, whereas the master watershed stewards um, concentrates on anything that would affect water systems. On this next slide is additional references that you can look for information. This over here, so you can take a picture of that if you'd like. Um, some of it is where I got some of the information from for today's presentation. And you can go on here and read a lot more. You can see a lot more information about these specific topics. 
And one thing to remember when you're looking to purchase native plants, please buy from a local plant sale um, by conservation groups, such as the Penn State Master Gardeners or from a native plant or local nursery. Um, don't collect plants from the wild, please. Uh, when buying native plants, ensure you're purchasing ones that are true natives and not varieties, which may be less useful to native insects. So you may see something that's for sale and you think, oh, that's beautiful. It's got these double blooms, you know, two layers of, of petals. Well, um, that's not the native, that's most likely a variety. And the, if it's, you know, harder for you to tell what type of plant it is, it's harder for the insect to know as well because insects travel and find flowers based on the way that they see. Sometimes they'll see different colorations on those petals. Um, and so they're gonna be attracted to the ones that are the native species rather than the variety. Um, also, please be sure when you purchase seeds that they're not coated with chemicals. And then here are some more pictures of native plants and their pollinators uh, that are in my gardens. So a lot of these pictures are all that I, throughout the deck are from my gardens. Okay, I'm going to um, ask for any questions. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, please do so. We also had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we have one from Jim and it asks, is there a list of invasives that have commonly been planted in gardens so we know what to replace? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go back a couple slides here. Go back up, oops. And up to here. So these are the lists of plants that are the natives. So most of these right here, um, ones that you can put in where you're living, some of them, you know, like this one, you could say where you're living and what kind of plants you're looking for. Um, as far as invasives, you could look that up on extension.psu.edu to find which ones are invasives. Um, some of the ones that are most commonly invasive and are non-natives are, uh, they're very easy to tell because they've kind of taken over an area. So if it's just specifically for your yard, you're going to be, you can go out to your yard and you can see, um, you know, what, what there is out there and you could kind of look at them and determine whether it's something that has been growing there for a while um, in a wild area, or if it just comes up every once in a while, um, you might have to do like a plant ID. I know there's a couple different plant IDs out there on, you can get for your iPhone and you can look it up that way. Um, but yeah, I think I'm pretty sure on this extension.psu.edu, there are a list of invasives. Um, one of the invasives that I know of that I actually, I and it's a non-native and I have in my yard, um, you know, Penn State Master Gardeners recommends that you have, you know, at a minimum 70% natives um, in your yard. But I do actually have um, the, uh, oh, what's it called? Um, the firebush. I can't think of the scientific name, but the firebush, it kind of has the very bright red leaves in the fall. And it has the, on the stems, it, it's very, um, bent and pointed, um, has very sharp edges on the, on the stems. Um, that has started to naturalize as more of an invasive non-native species. So you have to watch it. It will put out babies. I mean, I have a, I have an area that I'm trying to maintain about a quarter acre as a native landscape area. And I have to go in there and I have to pull those out. And um, butterfly bush, even though it is, it does attract butterflies and it smells great. That also will naturalize as a non-native invasive in your landscapes. So you have to watch for that. Um, other things I often get are like speed well um, that I have to pull out. Uh, stilt grass, Japanese stilt grass is one that is very hard to get rid of. I, I do most of my removal by hand. I prefer not to use chemicals if I can. So um, those, those are some of the more common ones. 
Do we have any other questions? Um, yeah. So we have another question. It says, is there a particular herbicide that is safe to use near water or wetlands that will not negatively impact amphibians? I'm trying to control poison ivy near a natural wetland. There's too much to pull and the person's very allergic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I ran into that too about trying to um, get rid of it. Like as far as an IPM type of, um, use that you can do. If you get to like have somebody help you in the winter time when there's no leaves out and you go, if you have like the, what they call the hairy monster, where it's a very thick vine with little tendrils sticking out of it, climbing up trees. Um, in that case, you can go out and have somebody actually come along with an ax and chop out a chunk of it down towards the base of the tree. And that kills off all of that um, poison ivy all through up that tree. And, um, and then after that, you could maintain it a lot easier um, with a type of spray. So you're not using quite so much spray. Um, you could also try maybe having somebody come in with a weed whacker and maybe, you know, cut that area back or mow it down um, when you're not in the area. Um, I know myself, I'm, I've become sensitized to being around poison ivy, so I get it very easily as well. Um, there, there are different sprays out there. Being a master gardener, one thing we don't do is like say, uh, specifically use this brand or that brand. Um, kind of point you in the direction of, you know, go and look and see what the label says. You know, look online and see what the label says, what type of spray it is. Uh, do your research and find out, um, you know, and find out whether it, it, it will tell you the warning on the, on the information on um, the safety data sheet about whether it is safe to do it near a body of water. Any other questions? Alrighty, um, one more. It says, where in Bucks County is a good place to buy native plants to start a new garden this spring or summer? So I actually did do that about four years ago. Um, I had a tree that became diseased and had to be cut down. It was about an eighth of an acre um, that then became open and could be planted. And so first I did a soil test, which you can um, do through Penn State Master Gardeners. And you put some soil in, they test it for you and give you results and tell you what kind of um, uh, like nitrogen, phosphorus and, and you know other chemicals that you might need to put back in that soil before you start your garden. Then once you are ready to start planting your garden after the soil um, has been um, ameliorated, then you can go to different um, local native plant places to pick up plants. Um, again, as a master gardener, we don't uh, purposely recommend specific places one over the other. Of course, we would like you to come to our sales that we have annually. Um, this year, the sales very limited. Um, I could probably get you that information if um, you know you wanna, I can contact, the group here and send the information out. Um, it's going to be by ordering blocks of types of plants and then being able to purchase them. But usually every year we'll have an entire parking lot full of plants that we have grown ourselves as master gardeners that are the true native species that then you can purchase and they're much less expensive than the local places to purchase them. And you know that for the most part, people are not using chemicals to grow them. Um, one of the places I do personally like to go is Bowman Hill Flower Preserve. They will post on their website when they're actually selling native plants um, at different times of the year. I also follow them on Facebook and Instagram to see when they're also selling. Um, I've gone there and I spend one to $200 every year and buy a ton of plants. Um, they'll also have plants that are on their, we're not sure what this is group that they sell like two bucks a piece. So that's always nice to get out there. You can get a whole, whole bunch of plants if you wanna repopulate a large area. Um, like I'm doing in the back of my yard. Um, but there are some other favorite places that I, I like to go to around here. 
Um, I like uh, Bucks Country Gardens. They may be a little bit more expensive. They're up Route 611, up above Doylestown, but um, they're very, very helpful. They're very knowledgeable and um, they have a very good refund policy. If something dies, um, they will refund you or give you another um, one in replacement. And then they also have a lot of bonus days where they give you a lot of coupons that you can use later in the summer. And then that's usually when I'll use my coupons to purchase um, my mosquito dunks and stuff like that for my pond. Okay, any other questions? Um, we're not as quite as, um as controlled about our um, recommendations. Um, we love, Bucks Audubon gets a lot of our plants from Gina's. I see Diane put that in the chat as well. It's in um, Wrightstown. They are a really, they're really great, incredibly knowledgeable, really nice people. Um, if you're looking at Upper Bucks, there's also Arc Wild, um, which does native plants um, in Upper Bucks County and like the Quaker Town area. Both of them are really great. Um, let's see, I think that is all the questions that were in the chat. Um, does anybody else have any questions? And welcome to write them in the chat or unmute yourself. Or if not, we can start to wrap up. All righty. Well, Susan, this was incredibly informative. Thank you so much. Um, I did put um, in the um, in the chat as well the link to the um, the Bowman's um, Hill. Um, presentation by Doug Tallamy. Um, so the link is in there if you want to go and sign up for that. Um, but yeah, I think this was really, really great. And um, hopefully lots of birds will benefit from it. So alrighty, and hopefully everyone will join us again next week. Um, we have, as I said, um, next week, we're going to be talking all about um, bird window collisions and how and what we can do to prevent those. So it should be a great presentation as well. So so thank you all so much. And hopefully we will see you again. Um, We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.